coming up on The World Today. The world marks International Holocaust Remembrance Day. U.S. officials call for calm as video footage of Ty Nicole's arrest to be released publicly today. An NGO ship rescues 130 migrants as Italy exasperates migrant rescue boat. May, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the program. I'm Melissa Walker in Lagos. We we'll begin with a new report launched 23rd January 2023 by the London-based NGO Free Tibet with its charitable research arm Tibet Watch. It has detailed previously unreported torture, detentions and destruction of Tibetan heritage in eastern Tibet. Tibetans living in Drago have been under siege by the Chinese government with numerous crackdowns on the Tibetan way of life for some years. However, Tibet Watch has found the crackdown on freedom of religion and culture escalated under Wang Dongsheng, the newly nominated Chinese party secretary of Drago. Free Tibet is urging the United Kingdom government to put pressure on China after major new evidence shows the destruction of religious and cultural sites and torture and detentions, which Tibetans are warning as a second cultural revolution. Well, to talk more about this, Mr. John Jones is the campaign and advocacy manager at Free Tibet, and he joins me now virtually from more, uh, for more. Welcome to the program. Could you describe the current human rights situation in Tibet and how it has changed in recent years? Thanks for having me. Uh, so Tibet has always been a uh, human rights, uh, an area of key human rights abuses since uh, the invasion uh, in uh, 1949 and the occupation uh, of Tibet uh, by China. But we would say that certainly since 2008, uh, which is recognized as the year of the Tibetan uprising against uh, Chinese rule, the crackdowns have been a lot harder and these have intensified under Xi Jinping, the current uh, leader of China, uh, who has not only flooded Tibet with security forces and uh, new surveillance technology, but also uh, carried out a campaign of systematic eradication of the key aspects of the distinct identity that Tibet has, including its religion, its culture, uh, its language, uh, and its way of life. Uh, this has taken many different forms, but the report that we've released details how one community has been put under siege with its cultural and religious heritage targeted uh, for destruction, uh, including several Buddhist statues, uh, and also uh, buildings around the community's monastery. How is the Chinese, and this is for those who aren't, who, who do not understand or are following this, how does the Chinese government justify its actions in Tibet? And, you know, how does uh, your organization, Free Tibet, respond to those justifications? Uh, it works at several different levels. So I'd say that the primary factor is the Chinese government lays claim to Tibet. So prior to the invasion and occupation, Tibet governed itself uh, and maintained its distinct identity. Uh, the Chinese government insists that Tibet is part of China, it's inseparable, and that any protests uh, or even any uh, expressions of Tibetan identity that lay claim to Tibet being a distinct entity are what they call splitism, uh, or in some cases they even refer to it as terrorism, uh, and that justifies the crackdowns by police security forces. Uh, they also use a lot more ad hoc justification. So one of the um, explanations that used for destroying the statues and the monasteries was things like uh, planning laws, uh, land registration and fire safety. Um, those explanations are easily dismissed. Uh, for one thing, the way that the dem uh, demolitions were carried out in Drangle County was that police made the local Tibetans tear down these statues themselves. And we know several cases of Tibetans who resisted this or expressed sadness at their heritage being destroyed, uh, being detained. Uh, and also the claims that this was done for fire safety um, 
sound ridiculous when we learned that not just did they destroy buildings, but they did other insulting things such as tearing down prayer flags, which is a key part of Tibetan Buddhism. They were hanging from the monastery um, and setting them on fire. Um, it's got nothing to do with um, safety. It's all about locking down a community that is displeasing the Chinese government by asserting its Tibetan identity. And John, when you think about the role of the international community, including governments, organizations, do you think they're doing enough regarding the human rights situation there? I don't, with one caveat, which is that it's extremely difficult to get information out of Tibet. I think it's an issue that a lot of people might have thought had been resolved because we used to hear so much more about it, but the Chinese government has really taken pains to make sure that Tibetans can't escape and the information is much harder to leave and you need that information before you can get outraged. Nevertheless, governments um, in Europe and um, North America, ones which we typically uh, expect to speak out, I think they could all do more. Uh, and I would also urge other nations, uh, including Nigeria, to um, also think about how they could assist by raising things such as religious freedom. Um, I think there's a lot more work to be done to challenge this. Um, what steps is Free Tibet taking to address some of these abuses and also to support them, since you are saying that they are going through a lot at the moment? Uh, the first thing that Free Tibet does is work with its sister organization, uh, Tibet Watch, to get the information out of Tibet. Uh, that's half of the battle and involves a lot of sustained research work. Once we have the information and we're confident uh, in its veracity, we take it to governments, not just the UK government, but other governments around the world, uh, and ask them to raise it either bilaterally with China or through forums like the United Nations and the human rights bodies. We also do a lot of campaigning work um, on the street. Um, we organize those with the Tibetan community in the UK uh, and a similar uh, organizations in other con uh, countries around the world that do likewise. Uh, and that could take the form of targeting companies that are collaborating with abuses in Tibet, um, raising awareness about political prisoners that need to be freed, um, or pushing back against new regulations and laws that have been imposed uh, in Tibet. And when you think of what's happening there, um, how would you say or reckon that the human rights situation relates to the broader issue of autonomy, self-determination for ethnic and religious minorities in China? I think it's key to note that it's not just Tibetans who are repressed under Chinese rule, and there's a lot of solidarity between Tibetans and the Uyghur people, um, who I think have been getting a lot of uh, attention in recent years as abuses of them have uh, emerged. There's also other people such as Southern Mongolians, even Chinese dissidents, um, who would obviously also identify as Chinese like their government, but even they are punished when they speak out. Um, Tibet is both a human rights struggle, but also one for Tibetans to have a genuine say over their country, how their country is governed and what role they have in ruling it. Um, I would say that human rights and the quest for autonomy are heavily linked into that because it's only when Tibetans can govern themselves that they can guarantee that things like this religious repression against them is brought to an end. Well, John Jones, we continue to watch um, what is going on and, of course, I uh, hope that you can indeed um, get more with the support that you're seeking for the people of Tibet. Many thanks. John Jones is the campaign and advocacy manager at Free Tibet. Thank you for joining me on the program. Thanks for having me. Well, the world marks International Holocaust Remembrance Day today, January 27, the 78th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. The World Zionism Organization reported an increase in global anti-Semitism, noting an uptick in anti-Semitic speech on social media. But some innovators are proving that new technology can also be a force for good and keep the memories alive. More than 1.1 million people, around 90% of them Jewish, were killed at Auschwitz, which was among a network of camps run by Nazi Germany on occupied Polish soil during World War II.
staying with his family, but he was not related to us. In Leicester, but now in London. Really? So our children and grandchildren. <laughs> I hear you used to be... In the meantime, Brit Britain's King Charles III and his wife, the Queen Consort, Camilla, hosted an audience today to mark Holocaust Memorial Day on the anniversary of the liberation of the concentration camp. The royals received two survivors of genocide at Buckingham Palace to hear about their experiences and light candles in remembrance. The day also commemorates subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Dafur. Uh, all those poor people who've had to suffer such horrors for so many years and still do. So the most They've important come out thing the other is end. to try and yeah. help people to That's understand. That's what's so important yeah. and able to tell them through. about it. Yeah. We shouldn't let it happen. Yeah. It's a bit of good to come to such a bad. You know, just to tell them. Mm -hmm. You're expected to. We had two other stories now where demonstrators, some claiming to be police officers, rioted in Haiti's capital city, Port-au-Prince, Thursday, protesting over recent killings of police officers by armed gangs in the country. The protesters wearing hoods, flak jackets and one with a shirt with the word police written on the sleeve roared through streets and motorbikes blocked roads with trucks and burning tires. A protester wearing a helmet and bulletproof vest says they are seeking justice for their brothers killed by bandits and asking for a reaction from the Prime Minister to the crisis. The mob later broke into the airport just as Prime Minister Ariel Henry was returning from a trip to Argentina. Haiti's National uh, Police and the Prime Minister's office did not immediately respond to requests for comment. And elsewhere, Palestinian mourners held a funeral procession for a 22-year-old man killed by Israeli army during clashes in the occupied West Bank city of Al Ram. Clashes erupted in the West Bank cities uh, after Israeli commandos killed seven gunmen and two civilians in a raid on the flashpoint town in the occupied West Bank Thursday. Palestinian officials said, staring fear of further flare-ups after the largest single death toll in years of fighting. The 22-year-old was named as Youssef Mohissan. Violence has surged since a series of lethal Palestinian street attacks in Israel in March and April. The attendant of the diplomatic stalemates has helped rally Palestinian support for Hamas and Islamic Jihad, which refuse coexistence with Israel, where Mr. Netanyahu's new hard-right government includes members opposed to Palestinian statehood. And those are the rules of uh, a gunman, we understand, opened fire at the Azerbaijan's embassy in Iran. Police said the gunman killed the embassy security chief and wounded two others. CCTV footage obtained by local reporters also showed the moment of the deadly armed attack inside the embassy in the Iranian capital, Tehran. The attacker broke through the guard post, killing the head of security with a Kalashnikov assault rifle. Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesperson Nasser Kanani strongly condemned the attack and says the issue is under investigation. Police in Tehran said they had arrested a suspect and are investigating the gunman's motive, which according to the Superintendent of Criminal Affairs in Tehran, Judge Mohammed Sahari, is personal. And we're back in the United Kingdom, where British Finance Minister Jeremy Hunt has promised to tackle the country's weak productivity with post-Brexit reforms to boost growth, but signaled that he would stick to tax rises that have angered some lawmakers in his Conservative Party. Mr Hunt, who steadied financial markets after the turmoil of former Prime Minister Liz Truss's mini-budget in September last year, is preparing to announce a plan for growth and a budget statement in March. Mr. Hunt's comments come days after the head of the Confederation of British Industry warned that Britain had been spectacularly overlapped and overtaken 
Another conservative insight is that risk taking by individuals and businesses can only happen when governments provide economic and financial stability. So the best tax cut right now is a cut in inflation. And the plan I set out in the autumn statement tackles that root cause of instability in the British economy. Real incomes haven't risen by as much as they could as a result. Confidence in the future, though, starts with honesty about the present. So we want to be one of the most prosperous countries in Europe. And today I want to set out our plan to address those issues. That plan, our plan for growth, is necessitated, energised and made possible by Brexit. The desire to move to a high-wage, high-skill economy is one that's shared on all sides of that debate. And we need to make Brexit a catalyst for the bold choices that will take advantage of the nimbleness and flexibilities that it makes possible. We're off to the United States where people in Memphis last night gathered at a candlelight vigil to demand uh, justice for the death of Ty Nichols as five former police officers were charged with his murder. Members of the community met at the Memphis Gate Park after dark and lit candles in honor of Nichols who died January 10 from injuries which prosecutors say he sustained in a violent encounter following a traffic stop. Nichols, a 29-year-old father, died while hospitalized three days after the confrontation during his arrest by five police officers. Officials were expected this evening to release police body-worn camera video of the incident, which a lawyer for Nichols' family likened to the notorious footage of Los Angeles police officers beating black motorist Rodney King more than 30 years ago. Well, for the Shelby County District Attorney, Steve Moroy, at a news conference, he says, we all want the same thing. We want justice for Tyree Nichols, director of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, who saw the video, said it is absolutely appalling. They are currently in custody. They are... Earlier today, the grand jury returned indictments against five former Memphis Police Department officers regarding the death of Tyree Nichols. These are the same five officers who were previously or recently terminated by the Memphis Police Department. They are currently in custody. They are Tadarius Bean, Demetrius Haley, Emmett Martin III, Desmond Mills Jr. and Justin Smith. The grand jury returned indictments against all five with the same charges. And we had previously met with the family of Tyree Nichols to go over what these charges were going to be. And that meeting with the family, I think, went rather well. Here are the charges. Second degree murder, aggravated assault, Aggravated kidnapping resulting in bodily injury. Aggravated kidnapping involving the possession of a weapon. Official misconduct through unauthorized exercise of power. Official misconduct through failure to act when there is a duty imposed by law. And official oppression. While each of the five individuals played a different role in the incident in question, the actions of all of them resulted in the death of Tyree Nichols, and they are all responsible. 
Welcome back. And we had earlier brought to you a story about the Memphis um, situation, the police vigil about Tyra Nichols, who died following um, beatings, uh, which police officers have been charged with. And we understand that the bodily uh, cam of those officers will be released today. Uh, Washington, D.C. correspondent Maria Bird uh, talks to us uh, about this. Hi, Maria. And, you know, this is another sad situation uh, you know coming from uh, the United States more upsetting news um, how important is it um, that you know this um, bodily camera will be released to the public and why because uh, we're already hearing that the, the visuals are very really appalling I mean this could ignite another protest uh, in the US couldn't it you're asking the questions that I think many Americans are asking. Um, and most importantly, you think of a Friday evening after 6 p.m. Central Time, which means 7 p.m. on the East Coast, and around 4 o'clock um, in the afternoon um, on the West Coast. And so you're correct. This could end up with a long weekend um, of hopefully what will not be violent outbreaks, but potentially could be. And so the question, as I know many are asking, is why even release the video? I think that we're in a climate now in a country right now where uh, the video being released is very important um, to the process um, and trying on behalf of the policing system and the American people. There's a lack of trust in that between the two entities. And so I think the releasing of the video is really about regaining trust. Um, and so, but I think the timing is one that I think um, many police departments across the country um, and the Department of Justice are going to have to be very keen and watchful um, as they uh, begin to watch to see what happens um, over the weekend uh, time. And are there notable checks um, which can prevent something of this sort from, from happening again? I mean, this is a matter that is before the courts, yes, but then we are seeing this and it's becoming rampant. Um, are there things that are happening internally in the police uh, departments to ensure that, you know, this is prevented from happening again? Well, the government um, of Memphis is the one that in which we'll be releasing the video. Um, and so this is outside of the police department's jurisdiction. Now, to your point, the five officers have attorneys, um, and so their attorneys could have brought forth and filed an action um, with the court that requested that these films and these videos not be released. I have not yet heard that that type of action has been brought forth uh, to the courts. Uh, but that would have been a viable option for uh, the attorneys. And maybe they want the video to be released. Maybe there's something there that they believe um, needs to be upheld in court. And maybe they want to ensure that people are clear on the specific actions of what has occurred. Uh, but again, we won't really know that until uh, that video is released later today. And finally, Maria, how are people in the U.S. reacting to issues like this involving, you know, police officers? Are citizens, do they still feel safe? Do they trust, um, you know, the police? And also, on the other hand, gun control, uh, you know, the shootings we've seen in California in the past week. You know, I think the American people um, are not surprised, but I think they continue to be outraged. I think that we're, um, as you said, gun violence, whether or not it's something that is at the hands of police where someone um, dies. And as we know, this was really big that this young man um, actually was in the hospital for several days after the meeting and, and actually succumbed to, to his death at that time, um, or it's actual you know, shootings that we've seen, these mass shootings um, in California. And so I think that what is happening is really reckoning uh, for the people um, in the United States. And the question is, how is the government going to be able to tackle this? Because we're looking at not only our law enforcement, but obviously the average American um, who's in a crisis place to violence. Maria, thanks for that update. Thank you. Well, perhaps it is an emphatic statement being made by the U.S. President Joe Biden, who yesterday held Lunar New Year celebrations at the White House. He reiterated calls against assault weapons and hate crimes, vowing we cannot be silent. The celebrations come as a 66-year-old immigrant farm worker was formally charged with premeditated murder Wednesday in the fatal shooting of seven co-workers near San Francisco, the second of two gun rampages in California 
Estonia in recent days in which 18 people were killed. Authorities said each of the two killing sprees represented the single greatest loss of life from a single act of violence in Los Angeles and San Mateo counties. God bless them all. Children in the law, COVID-19 hate crimes act. No, and Wonderful to see so many friends on this special holiday, even as we gather with such heavy hearts. Our prayers are with the people of Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay and after yet another spree of gun violence in America. These are tight-knit communities, as you all know. They will be affected by what they saw and what they lost for the rest of their lives. We've got to think about the impacts of post-traumatic stress on many of these folks. And as a nation, we have to be there with them. We have to be there with them. We don't have a choice. There were grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles, siblings, friends, neighbors, but they're fellow Americans. So please join me in a moment of silence to honor them. Jill and I are honored to welcome you to the first Lunar New Year reception of this scale held in the White House, your home. This is your home. No, this, this is the people's house. This is the year of the rabbit. And for others like the Vietnamese, Vietnamese community, it's the year of the cat. And the rabbit, earnest and persistent in the face of great challenges. The cat, majestic, beloved, a protector. By the way, that sounds like our cat Willow, who maybe, <laughs> you think I'm kidding, Willow may walk in here any time now. She has no limits. And, <laughs> oh, you think I'm kidding, I'm not especially in the middle of the night when she climbs up and lays on top of my head. Look, folks, it's real simple. Silence is complicity. Silence is complicity. We cannot be silent. I will not be silent. And one more thing, we're going to ban assault weapons again and if I know that. It was President Joe Biden while staying with the Half Moon Bay uh, in the wake of the shootings there. The farming community in Half Moon Bay, they're relying on donations and basic supplies more than ever. Audano Latino's Asona Alice is at the forefront of relief efforts, holding a food drive. Uh, volunteers loading up cars with boxes filled with chicken, bread and other perishables. Alas, program director says his demand for the organization's services have been in high, uh, have been high ever uh, more than ever since the coronavirus pandemic. Alice had been preparing to distribute food boxes to farmers hard hit by recent storms. Of course, Monday shooting left farmers desperate and in need of even more help. I mean, we haven't stopped at all. But right now, you know, high alert. You know, our community needs us. They've been needing us for, for years, but we are still here. They know we have this incident. You know, the shooting is a, it's a tragedy that we lost seven community members, seven family members to this violence. Tragedy. It happened during work hours where children were present. You know, since the pandemic, you know, it's been nonstop for us. You know, we, we have been on the front lines, you know, providing a lot of resources, you know, for communities, especially for farm working community that, have, that has been neglected for, you know, for decades. We can go pretty much into any farm and they recognize who, you know, who Alas is. They know what we are there for. They know that we are there for them because we work for them. We have various programs, education programs, the, you know, the, we have the farm worker program that offers, you know, lunches. We go to the farms and bring lunches for our farm workers, and we sit down with the farm workers to eat lunch. Well, away from the United States, but staying with the lunar celebration, Swiss ambassador to China, Jerg Burry, extended his warm regards to Chinese people for the spring festival and looks forward to seeing more people-to-people -people exchanges between uh, the two countries in the new year. To celebrate the spring festival or the beginning of the Chinese lunar new year, Burry and staff members from the Swiss embassy in China made a special video to express their best wishes to Chinese people.
Facebook parent Meta says it's reinstating the accounts of US President Donald Trump on the platform as well as Instagram in the coming weeks. It was kicked off the platforms for two years after what the company called praise for people engaged in violence at the US Capitol building January 6, 2021. In a blog post, Meta claims new guardrails were added to deter repeat offenses. Its president of global affairs, Nick Clegg, said Mr. Trump will face heightened penalties in light of his violations. If he breaks Meta's community standards again, it could result in a new suspension ranging from one month to two years, depending on the severity. Well, the story is now. France and Iraq will sign a treaty seeking to strengthen bilateral relations with and in anti-corruption, security, renewable energy and culture. This according to LEC Palace. French President Emmanuel Macron Thursday evening welcomed Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammed Shah al-Sundani for a meeting in Paris. The two leaders signed a strategic partnership agreement that puts in place a roadmap that expands the horizon of cooperation between the two countries in a variety of fields. The French presidency said the set of strategic agreements were meant uh, indeed to boost Baghdad's economic cooperation with Paris, especially in the energy and public transportation sectors. And finally on the program, Egypt's renowned archaeologist Zahi Hawaz has announced the discovery of important tombs hosting a 4,300-year-old mummy in Saqqara Necropolis near the pyramids of Giza. Several other items, including Sacco Faguses, statues and pottery, have also been found among the tombs. The mummy, a man named Heka Sherpes, was found inside a large rectangular limestone in a room located under a 15-metre deep shaft. The Egyptologists added that many stone vessels were seen around uh, the same vessel, which was completely sealed when the mission discovered it. Now, that's an important archaeological finding. Well, that's our programme this week. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker.